So last Sunday, we heard again about the first experience of the Passover. The night the angel of death, the tenth plague, came over Egypt in search of every firstborn. But those who had followed God's command, given through Moses, and painted their doorways with the blood of a lamb, were spared. Remembering that event has defined a whole race of people since then. But back to our story today from Exodus 32. Fleeing Egypt in the middle of the night, the people of God find themselves unsure of a direction. So God leads them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They arrive at the banks of the Red Sea, but Egypt's army is gaining on their heels. God commands Moses to lift his arms with the staff in his hand, and then God opens the sea, creating a dry path on which the Israelites could walk to safety. This is Exodus. The word itself means going out. It is the story of the Israelites going out, their exit from slavery by the power and might of God's hand. And after 400 years of oppression, they are now finally free. Today's story takes place shortly after that experience of freedom. At the base of Mount Sinai, and at first glance, the story could be taken as a narrative commentary on the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, you shall not make for yourself an idol. But it could also just as easily be understood as a commentary on the fickleness of human nature and the faithfulness of God. We are the kind of creatures who do exactly what we are told not to do, and God is the kind of creator who keeps promises. So as we jump into today's reading, I'm giving you a little homework assignment. I want you to pay attention to the recurring phrase, who brought us out, up out of the land of Egypt. Who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. It actually takes place five times in this story. I want you to think about it almost like a chorus or a refrain winding its way through the story. The recently emancipated people had been reclaimed by God and they had received the two tablets of the covenant, transcribed by the Lord and given to Moses. Everything seemed to be going just fine. But then Moses had been called back up the mountain to commune with God to receive further instructions and he had been gone a long time. And so, scene one. The camera pans across the thousands of people camped at the base of the mountain. They are visibly, that's right, Gavin, just like that, panning across the people. I have a camera guy now. <clears throat> the people are visibly agitated. They are even afraid. They're beginning to fear that they have lost their human leader. He'd been gone for weeks. Now, I wonder, do you remember being a kid in school? If the teacher had to leave the class for more than a couple of minutes, what would happen? Right, so in my experience, Lynn just said chaos. In my experience, it really did not take very long for some weird Lord of the Flies stuff to start happening. The class broke rank, tribes quickly formed, some kid is hiding in with the coats crying. Uh, questionable behavior arose, lawlessness reigned, eat or be eaten. I mean, thankfully, the teacher usually showed up before that last part. Sorry, Piggy. Usually. Anyway, Moses was gone too long, and the Israelites were kind of panicking. So they gathered around Moses' brother, Aaron, and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Now, wait a second. That's not quite right, is it? I mean, I suppose on the human level, Moses was the person that God commissioned to lead the people out of Egypt. But on a deeper, on a theological level, the people are dead wrong. It wasn't Moses but God who brought the people out of Egypt. As the first commandment says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So there is a half-truth here, 
and that's dangerous. It's at the root of most heresies. This first scene exposes what happens when God's people fall prey to the temptation of confusing a human spiritual leader with God. When that leader disappears, people can lose sight of God and lose faith in their direction. Panic can set in, agitation, confusion, and questionable decision-making. Having lost sight of God and in turn lost their direction, the Israelites long for a visible, tangible image of God to lead them. They are panicking and afraid. So come, they say to Aaron, make a God for us who shall go before us. Now scene two, the camera closes in on Aaron. No, don't. Faced with the anxious energy of thousands of newly freed slaves, Aaron hears their demands and gets to work. He gathers jewelry from the people, melts it down and makes a golden calf. Now, quick aside here, Someone asked me at our virtual church gathering this past Wednesday night where the gold came from, if they were slaves. This is a fantastic question, and it shows me that the people of God at Knox Oakville are engaging the texts and asking them questions. Yes. First of all, not everyone who left Egypt uh, in the Exodus was a Hebrew slave. Many other foreigners and even some Egyptians themselves joined their ranks and they likely brought some wealth with them. But also, there are these little verses at the outset of Exodus chapter 11 that imply that the Hebrews were to ask all their Egyptian neighbors for objects of silver and gold and that God would compel their neighbors to comply. I mean, it sounds like pillaging to me. So this is a sermon for another time, because that whole piece raises some serious ethical red flags. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it accounts for the gold given to Aaron and what comes next. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel. Now, another fun fact, because I'm full of them. The word here for deity can be understood as plural or singular, kind of like the word brains. These are your gods, or this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You heard it, right? When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before the calf, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to revel. You done messed up, eh, Aaron? The traditional convictions against Aaron are apostasy and idolatry. That Aaron crafted an image of a false god. But some commentators have come to Aaron's defense by arguing that the calf was intended to function as a symbol of the God of Israel. Yahweh, not other gods. So it couldn't be apostasy. And others have gone even further by suggesting that the golden calf was intended just as a seat for God, a throne, something for God to ride atop, like the, like the Ark of the Covenant or one of those ride-on bulls at the bar. And so it's not idolatry. Well, neither of these defenses hold water against God's reaction at seeing the golden calf. The resulting divine rage suggests that Aaron and the people have committed more than a minor infraction. But I actually agree with the spirit of Aaron's defense attorneys. It's not simple idolatry or apostasy, Aaron's screw-up was a symptom of his people-pleasing leadership style. Aaron was willing to compromise on the theological details in order to appease the people. The people wanted a tangible image of the divine, of something more accessible than Yahweh, and they wanted intermediaries who were less cranky than Moses. 
So Aaron fudges a bit. He makes him a calf and lets them think what they want about it. And that was his mistake. In the noise of the growing revelry, you can hear Aaron sheepishly in the background sort of say, cool, folks, um, we'll have a feast to Yahweh, right? Because this is about God, right? But I don't think anyone was listening. Aaron does not correct the people's theological misconceptions. He hears them chanting, these are your gods. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And I can picture him just wincing, casting his eyes nervously at the smoke and fire billowing from the top of Mount Sinai, where he knew his brother communed with the God of creation. Nevertheless, Aaron let people's half-truth stand to de-escalate their mounting anxiety. And that is what I believe was his error. Of course, the golden calf was an idol. I'm not denying that. But if we could lift the veil from our eyes for one minute, we'd see that our lives are riddled with golden calves. Things that we worship because they assuage our anxiety, quell our existential dread if only for a moment. Idols feed our need for control. Money, power, fame, career, our smartphones, social media, the stocks, politics, things that we can focus on intensely that will muffle the panic residing in our bones. But idols aren't just found in the secular world, are they? They're in our religious lives, too. Things that we associate so much with God that we inadvertently end up worshiping them instead of God. The church building, the old liturgy, the retired minister, the stained glass windows, even a doctrine to which we cling too tightly. This has been a blessing of the pandemic because it has shaken us loose of those things we cling to too tightly. And this form of idol can actually be even more dangerous to faith than secular idols because there is a half truth in it. It is connected to the divine somehow, so it must be okay to worship it, right? To uphold it. And before long, it becomes the thing you believe saved you, not God. Scene three. Now we switch up to the mountaintop. I don't know, Gavin, you need a drone or something to get up there. We switch to the mountaintop where the Lord is consulting with Moses. In the middle of their team meeting, God catches a glimpse of what's going on down at the base of the mountain. And so turning to Moses, God roars, go down at once, Moses, your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and they've worshipped it, and they've sacrificed to it, and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, hold up. Just hold up. Did you catch our refrain? Brought up out of the land of Egypt? I mean, don't, don't tell him I said this. But God actually got it wrong. <clears throat> It's like when you're out in public and your kid starts acting up, suddenly they become the sole extension of the other parent. Your kid is being a menace. Can you please get your kid under control? The Lord says to Moses, hey, these are your people. You brought them up out of the land of Egypt. But pay attention because God's rage in this moment is profoundly underscored by allusions to the judgment that preceded the flood in Genesis. God is mad. God calls the Israelites perverse or corrupted, which was the same words that God used to describe the people just before flooding the earth. The offer God was making to Moses on the mountain in that moment was similar to the one that God made to Noah. A proposal to start over with the one person that God approves of after destroying everyone else. And then he says, now let me alone, Moses, so that, I, so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them 
and of you I will make a great nation. <clears throat> oh boy. So, scene four, the fourth and final scene. Moses is finally the only one in this story to actually tell the truth. Lord, Israel is your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. And so this is the fifth time we've heard this refrain. And finally, it is correct. Moses continues, Lord, <clears throat> remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self? That's right. Moses throws the promise to Abraham right back at God in a bold act of intercessory prayer. You promised, Lord. You promised Abraham, you promised Isaac, you promised Israel. By your own name, you promised. The calf may have been made of gold, but one thing is for certain, Moses had certain anatomical parts made of steel. Imagine challenging God like that. An angry, hurt, irritated God. Imagine standing in the breach between a righteously angry creator, God had every right to be angry, and a fickle, brainless creation. And then having the audacity to remind God of God's commitments and promises. Whew. And then the good book says the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. It is endlessly revealing to me that God hadn't chosen some yes man to be God's right hand human. God chose one with the guts and the smarts to crack the whip on the people of God but also brave enough to challenge God if need be. A major crisis threatens the relationship between God and the people, but with Moses' reminder, God ultimately refuses to give up on these stiff-necked people, these former slaves, the people of God, who would be a blessing to all nations. And I don't know about you, but that makes me endlessly grateful. Because like my spiritual ancestors in the wilderness, I get it wrong too. I have been known to panic and make questionable choices. And maybe you have too. I have occasionally given in to people pleasing in order to calm people's anxiety or to feel some degree of control, even if only temporary. And maybe you have too. I have gotten hurt and in my anger have blamed others instead of doing the work of seeking to understand them. And maybe you have too. And so I am beyond grateful for a God who keeps their promises. Even when keeping those promises means God has to forgive rather serious infractions. Exodus 32 can't just be boiled down to the golden calf. It's a commentary on the fickleness of human nature, the dangers of dealing in half-truths, and ultimately the faithfulness of God. We are the kind of creatures who do exactly what we're told not to do, and God is the kind of creator who keeps promises. What a reason to give thanks this day and every day. To God be all the glory.